I'd like you to meet an interesting lady. I have not met her myself, but Ada Louise Huxtable is uh, architecture critic for the New York Times. And we all live in cities, whether we like it or not. Lately, we like it less, but I'm told that she is an inveterate lover of New York City, and she has some thoughtful and provocative things to say and to write about the plight of our battered civilization and how it got that way. Uh, will you welcome, please, direct from the Times, Ada Louise Huxtable. <laughs> Is that a see-through dress? Oh. <laughs> Why do I always ask questions that answer themselves? It is and it isn't, isn't it? I don't need to answer. No, of course not. You can reject that question. Uh, th th there is, let me change the subject to filth, noise, and uh, pollution, and all of the things that we uh, in New York live among. Is that right? All the time. Uh, C can you think of uh, two or three reasons for staying in New York City? What's your reason? Mine? You know you've got me. <laughs> I really don't know. When I, I used to, some years ago, just say I, I love being here. When I came from Nebraska, I went to school in the East, I used to come to New York on weekends. And I used to think, maybe there'll be a time when I can come down here and I'll live here and I'll never have to leave. Do you live in New York now? And now I live in New York. In and Manhattan? now, I, yeah, in Manhattan. Now, if I had to leave, I would shed less than, oh, half a dozen tears, I think. Where would you like to go? Where do you want to go? <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Um, it's the, I'm, I watched Groucho Marx for years, and that's the influence. I like. So did I. Yeah. Groucho Marx and Lewis Mumford were the two men who taught me most of what I know. There's two great comics. Wonderful men, both yeah. of them. Um, did, what would you say, though? Uh, isn't New York worse now than it was when I came here a few years ago? I think New York is getting progressively worse. In fact, the things you said at the beginning of the show, which were so amusing, also made it very clear how bad it is. The mm -hmm. breeze that stops the subway and the pollution in the air. And yet we are all very dedicated. We do stay here. And you say yeah. you'd like to leave, but there is a tremendous commitment to the city by many people. It's well, a lot just of them are just frankly here. stuck here well, because we're of the stuck job. here, and, and in a funny way, we love it. Mm -hmm. New Yorkers will complain about New York. They're professionals at it. They can do it better than anyone in the world. And yet they'll also rise to its defense. There's something about this city. It has a kind of a magic and magnificence in spite of all its problems that keeps people here. Yeah. Uh, there's something about, um, I want to ask you about the landmarks in New York, because it seems like every time you turn around, something is being ripped down that looks great. It's happened in every neighborhood that I've lived in. Um, all the apartments that I've ever lived in have been torn down. None of them were considered landmarks for that reason. <laughs> but, so uh, are they really? Yes. It's like some giant yeah. thing is following me around New York and ripping down every <laughs> place I've, I've been. I've had the same experience. We're all very transient. Yeah. But uh, is this working now? Are we, can we really um, outwit the... Uh, the the forces of destruction that want to rip down most of Manhattan? Well, can you outwit real estate? I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, one of the chief uh, federal officers of the Urban Renewal Program some years ago said that New York was the only city he knew that was completely shaped and formed and run by real estate interests. Mm -hmm. The government, the, uh, the city government itself, the mayor, the uh, various city agencies, really did very little to influence what was going on in the city, that it was simply a matter of what was most profitable for the people who built the buildings. And I think that has a lot to do with getting us in the mess that we're in, because real estate people are not sociologists, they're not altruists, they're interested in a very healthy profit, which they get, it's rather an extraordinarily profitable business. And it leaves you with very ordinary buildings, very uh, bad facilities for people, very bad transportation, very few amenities. As the big buildings go up, you lose your restaurants, you lose your shops. And then the thing that I think is the most dreadful thing of all, which is a, a bank going in on the ground floor of every new building, and New York is becoming a bore. We used to walk along one very fascinating shop after the other. Now you have just one slick bank after the other, and unless you like to look at banks or money, it's pretty uninteresting. Mm -hmm. 
Aren't there enough talented architects around? Uh, is there any reason why we have to get so many ugly buildings? Well, first of all, the architects aren't used by the big developers, very few of them. If you name a building by a good architect, like the Seagram Building or the Ford Foundation Building, they're handsome, mm -hmm. they're beautiful buildings. We can argue about them, but they're certainly superior buildings. But the average big real estate developer uses a cut-rate architect or doesn't use any architect at all. For a big mm -hmm. building, he uses what is commonly considered a cut-rate architect, less than first-rate and cheap. Yeah. We seem to have adjusted to the Guggenheim Museum. Remember a few years ago, that was all you heard about was, are they really going to put that thing up? And they finally did, and now it's there. Were you opposed to the Guggenheim? No, I was never opposed to it. I think it has a little trouble with its neighbors because it's such a different building that it mm -hmm. fights with them a bit. But I'm never opposed to anything that's interesting or dramatic or shows some creative spirit or talent or something that gives the city interest and drama. I think this is all to the good. It is dramatic, the Guggenheim, when you stand under that spiral. It's I started a rumor that it was screwing itself into the ground. <laughs> it didn't get anywhere with that. Oh, we're talking during the break, and Mr. Lancaster was saying that in Paris, this is news to me, you, you can't change anything, apparently, without... Well, uh, any, any, uh, any restaurant or old building that is designated by the government as having been from a certain period in French history must remain exactly as it was, let's say, when it first functioned in, say, 1735. Mm -hmm. Now, you own the building, the person owns it, let's say, a restaurant. They operate it like any restaurateur operates his restaurant. But if they, they want to make a change, any kind of basic change, uh, a, a light fixture, a doorknob, a new pane of glass, a chair, a table, they cannot, it cannot be touched without it being built in an exact replica of the time in which it was originated. Hmm. So you see these marvelous old places that you come into that just have so much character. And it's because there is, well, one thing, they have a minister of culture, you know. Mm -hmm. So they address themselves to the problem, <laughs> which unfortunately we do not have. Sounds very much like Los Angeles. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> we have a marvelous music center there. <laughs> is the architecture of Los Angeles a, a, a particularly freakish? Uh, well, I must confess to you, I've never been to Los Angeles. What? I have never been to Los Angeles. You're a provincial. I am. I'm a provincial New Yorker. Gee, I, that's amazing. I would think that your work would have taken you there at some point or other. I frankly have avoided it. What I know about it doesn't make me too happy. Mm -hmm. I will go. I know. I've been to San Francisco, which I find an exciting, yes. wonderful city. But on preservation, London also has um, very interesting preservation laws. You know, we have a landmark law now. We're trying to save some of our old buildings in New York, and while they're not really old, some of them are quite charming and quite interesting, and they're the best we've got, so you've just got to stick with the best you've got. There aren't that many. It's getting so a, a landmark in New York is anything that was up last week, uh, it seems like. It's just, you've heard about I mean, the group that's banding together to save the Seagram building? No, I didn't know about that. <laughs> I'm glad to know about that. Uh, what cities are doing it right, would you say, in, in America? In America, I would have a very hard time finding any city that was doing it right. Mm -hmm. I think the reason that we all go to Europe so much is to see cities that are doing it right, that have this rich culture and all of this uh, pleasure, because after all, this is basically pleasure for all of us to enjoy these places. Mm -hmm. They have it and they keep it, and they have laws to preserve it, and they're sensitive to it. And in this country, we have very little, and we're very late in getting around to trying to keep what we have. Why is it important, the architecture of a city? Do you feel any different personally in a city that has a certain magnificence and beauty than you do in a very humdrum, dull city that's just a collection of dull, uninteresting, ugly buildings? No. Do you feel different as a person? Yes, of course I do. You know what a city I like uh, for the look and the feel of it? Uh, I haven't been much, or I haven't been to Europe at all except to London, and that I love London. But um, Chicago, uh, uh, this will surprise a lot of people maybe, or maybe it won't, but Chicago has a terrific feel to it. It's got a, it's got a lot of, uh, is it Louis Sullivan buildings? and? Um, Yes, it does. It's, it's a great city. It's been called the second city for so long that people mm -hmm. just think of it this way. But in the last 10 years, that city has put up more good buildings, beautiful, handsome, first-rate examples of architecture. And the city has blossomed, not just culturally in its people, but in its institutions and in its character and in at its atmosphere. And I, I rank it as one of our very top cities mm -hmm. now. Uh, is, is it possible that Mayor Daley is doing something right? 
Well, he's, he's a marvelous hate object and perfect example of many things that are wrong, but he has done one thing right. He's about the only mayor in the country who can handle the building trades, the building unions. Why? Is he just tough with them? He's tough. He talks turkey to them, and he can get them to build prefab stuff. Mm -hmm. If you can't build prefab, if you can't get factory assembled parts for housing, you're just never going to have enough housing for this nation. We know it's one of our critical problems. Yeah. We're all suffering from it in one way or another, but the poor are suffering the most. And unless you can get the building trades to cooperate, to devise new, uh, really mass-produced ways of, of building housing, you're never going to have enough housing, and at present, they simply refuse. Do you think of cities as masculine or feminine in, in nature? I was thinking one of the words that I would use to describe Chicago is, is a sort of masculine. It is masculine. City, I think cities vary. It's, it's interesting that one does think of them this way. Mm -hmm. Venice is almost feminine, don't you think so? I hear it is. I, I think San Francisco is. This will offend them, I expect, because the minute you step off a plane in San Francisco, they say, how do you love San Francisco? You know? <laughs> but, uh, how, do you, it, how do you classify London? L London is, is so good, I can't begin Isn't to tell great? you. Yeah, uh, something, uh, when Americans go to London, almost always they just feel this great thing about it. What cities do you feel best in well, Mr. I Lancaster? Well, I London to any city I've ever been to. So do I. But from the sheer so point of beauty and grace and charm and yeah. femininity, uh, Paris is easily the most beautiful. It is the one truly beautiful city yes. in the world, but I'd still take London. Mm -hmm. I'd go to London tomorrow in spite of my loyalty to New York. Yeah. And you, have you been to San Francisco? Yes. It is quite beautiful. Uh, it, it it's not beautiful. effeminate, it's feminine. Did, we, did I say effeminate? Um, <laughs> don't you find it beautiful, San Francisco? Yes, the location is beautiful, and mm -hmm. uh, it just makes a beautiful I find uh, San Francisco yeah. heterosexual. <laughs> Well, you would. <laughs> well, well, while we figure that anyway. out. <laughs> uh, if you think cleaning a rug is a big job, <laughs> do I seem to have changed the subject? Pay attention to this. Mrs. Huxtable, Mr. Lancaster, you were a pleasure to have here. And tomorrow's guests will be Larry Hankin, Peter Moss, Alejandro Ray, Gary Puckett, and the Union Gap. The whole Gap is going to be here? And future guests will be Gordon Parks and Mary McCarthy and Sal Minio and Nicole Williamson or people by those names. And we will see you tomorrow. Is that it? Good night. Uh -huh.